please go ahead. All right. See most of us work. Give you five more seconds if you haven't voted yet. Share your thoughts. All right. So let's take a look at the results. So we see that the plurality prefer the 90% fat free. Next, we have so something like just over two fifths. Then just over a fifth one want 10% fat and just over a third would have no preference. Now, if we think about this, 90% fat-free means it's 10% fat, right? 10% fat means it's 90% fat-free. But we see very clearly that the large majority of us have a very distinct preference. So what's going on here? Well, the framing effect has to do with the fact that we interpret information and make decisions by how information is framed for us. So 90% fat-free, some people prefer that, some people prefer 10% fat. But in reality, these are the same things. I, if we were fully rational people and didn't have a pref, didn't have a new way of having just a illogical approach, one that's not informed by what the actual facts say, we would have no preference. But we do have an approach. We are people. We are human people. We're not rational. The employees who we compensate are not rational. And we need to understand that, that the way that information is framed to us and the way that we frame information to others is fundamentally important for how we think about hybrid work and how we think about flexibility. And that, of course, comes out in the compensation benefits package associated with it. Now, I know that there was someone in the chat who said that staff value remote work on like an 8.5% salary bump. So person making 100% will feel like it's 108.5 thousand. Yeah, so we have different research on this. Apparently, the more your salary is, the more you tend to value it. And so there was research showing that people at top firms would prefer more flexible work, would prefer fully remote work over a 30,000 pay bump. And of course, top firms, they earn quite a lot of money. So basically, the higher your salary is, the more of it you're willing to give up in order to have flexibility. And that's, again, on average. And it's kind of understandable why that is, because, of course, as compensation professionals, you know that the marginal dollar for people who are better off is going to be less important to them than the marginal dollar for people who are not as well off. And so if you are making 200,000, an additional dollar is going to be quite a bit less important to you, or an additional thousand dollars is going to be quite a bit less important to you than if you're making $50,000. However, at $50,000 and at $200,000, a day of your time is worth the same amount, is the same amount in terms of time, right? So people, are earning $200,000 will be much more willing to give up a higher amount of money to get a day of their time than people who are earning $50,000. So again, people who are earning $200,000 will be willing to give up a day of their time, will be willing to give up much more money for a day of their time than people earning $50,000. So that means in terms of compensation that people who are earning quite a bit more money in the companies that you run, that where the, you work on determining compensation, will be willing to give up quite a bit more money for more flexibility. And that's a great trade-off for you because you can keep your payroll costs down if you figure out how to give more flexibility to people who are earning more money and they will be more likely to stay around because to them, their time is just simply worth more and their free time is worth more. So that's something that's really important for you to be thinking about. Now, framing around hybrid work is really important in terms of how we communicate to leaders and to employees. And what I see, especially with leaders, is many leaders tend to see hybrid work as a loss, as a big problem. 
So you're seeing companies like UPS and UPS and Boeing saying, well, we don't want to do hybrid work. We want to do full time in the office. And that's because they're treating hybrid work as a loss. Instead, they need to be thinking of this as a disruption and therefore an opportunity. So you need to seize opportunity in this disruption. So frame hybrid work as a major opportunity to improve productivity and retention while cutting costs. And we'll talk about productivity and retention, but we already are highlighting the cutting costs for you as compensation professionals. Because again, people who are, especially people who are earning more money, they're more willing to give up more of that money for more free time. And that includes percentages of money. So someone who is earning $200,000 will be willing to give up a higher percentage, not simply the total sum of their money. They'll be willing to give up a higher percentage of their money than someone who is willing earning 50,000. So again, there's really good opportunities for you to cut down your payroll costs here. And that's what allows smart and savvy leaders in compensation and other areas to seize competitive advantage. And I want you to encourage the folks that you work with and for you yourself, but especially the leaders who you talk to and advise in compensation to put aside default assumptions, habits, and preferences and focus on what is the bottom line for the company. Focus on business objectives and outcomes rather than what might feel personally comfortable. And that's how we'll overcome decision-making cognitive biases on the future of work and integrate best practices on innovative work arrangements including thinking about how to cut costs effectively and use compensation to as a trade-off for flexibility. So, so that's the way to think about flexibility and hybrid work. Now let's talk about some data on this. So there's been eight major independent surveys by organizations like the Harvard Business School, Society for Human Resource Management, Gallup, which don't really have any stake in the outcome, which showed that a large amount of remote capable workers don't want traditional office-centric work. So companies like UPS and Boeing, which are forcing the remote capable employees to come to the office full-time and Tesla and so on are making a serious mistake and they're losing a lot of talented employees. And we see that they're leaving these companies. That 75 to 85% of workers don't want traditional office-centric work. And 25 to 35% want full-time remote work. That means, of course, that something like 50 to 60% want hybrid work. So want a structured hybrid model, which is indeed very clearly where most companies are heading. 40 to 55% would leave their job if forced to come in full time. And we indeed do see, so for example, Tinder made their staff come in and they saw something like 45% of their staff leaving. So we did definitely see that happening. Over 70% are less likely to leave if offered substantial remote work. Now, we know that working from home improves people's well-being. And so that, of course, is an important aspect of benefits. We're talking about, we, I was starting to the conversation here by highlighting compensation, but we really want to think about benefits as well. So mostly or fully remote work would make 75%, more than 75% feel happier over 70% feel less stressed and over 75% better able to manage work-life balance. So this is very clearly something that gives people very significant benefits. And so want to be really aware of that. Now, there are some challenges with remote work. Over 50% feel overworked, over 55% experience burnout, more for young adults, over 80% want fewer meetings, and biggest issues are that 60% cite poor virtual communication skills and over 55% cite technology issues. And these issues are resolvable. And I'll talk about in the second half of the presentation in terms of best practices for hybrid work of how to resolve them. But we do want to be aware that if you don't approach hybrid work and remote work appropriately, if you don't use best practices, and many companies don't, they just try to use office-based practices to do remote work. That's why so many people feel overworked, burned out. There's poor virtual communication skills, technology issues. Those are things we'll need to address. But let's talk right now about a huge issue in remote and hybrid work, which is productivity. And you've probably heard a lot of different perspectives on this. So I want to come at this from a very research-based perspective. 
from peer-reviewed randomized trials, which is the gold standard for how you actually know something. So there's a peer-reviewed randomized trial published by the National Bureau of Economic Research. And I'll send you the slides, but that is the link to the paper, which you can check out yourself so you can go in depth and verify what I'm telling you right now. And it was look at a major travel agency with 35,000 staff called trip.com which wanted to measure the impact of hybrid work versus in-office work. And so what it did is, is it collaborated with Stanford University, actually Nick Bloom at Stanford University, who is the most prominent researcher on hybrid work, on a randomized trial. So here's what it did. It assigned staff in its airfare and IT divisions to a full-time schedule, half of the staff, and staff with even numbered birthdays. The staff with even numbered birthdays in the air airfare and IT divisions had to go to the office on a full-time schedule, Monday for Friday, nine to five. And the other half of the staff who had odd-numbered birthdays had a flexible work arrangement. So flexible work arrangement of hybrid work. So you have half of the staff, again, randomly assigned based on whether their birthdays is even or odd-numbered to a full-time schedule, half to a flexible hybrid schedule. They didn't make any other significant changes to adapt to hybrid work or train managers on doing hybrid work. So managers weren't trained in assessing hybrid work performance or any other issues. What metrics did they use? There were two metrics of productivity that they used. One was lines of code written for programmers, and the second was manager assessment of performance. And they also measured retention, engagement, and sick days, so other issues as well, but we're, I'm focusing on productivity here. So the results of this randomized trial. Productivity, Managers did not see any difference between the in between the people who worked in a hybrid flexible schedule and those who worked in the office. But when we looked at the objective data, which is the lines of code written, the hybrid group had an increase of over four percent of lines of code written compared to the same compared to the lines of code written for the in office group. So this finding aligns with other research that shows that a slight boost for productivity in hybrid work, so people who weren't working in a hybrid modality. What about other metrics? Well, the hybrid group had a great improvement in retention, 33% improvement, and that's over a six-month period. So think about what a boost to retention your company might have compared to a full-time in office if it had a hybrid schedule, which hopefully you do, but if you don't, this is something to be thinking about. And it had fewer sick days where people who were working in a hybrid modality they can take some of their days that they were sick, they worked remotely. The rank and file workers had higher satisfaction with the hybrid modality, but managers unfortunately had lower satisfaction because most likely they weren't trained in hybrid work management. Let's talk about another peer reviewed trial, also published by National Bureau of Economic Research, where a staff at a call center were offered the chance to apply for work from home, and then half were randomly chosen to do so. So here we have a different modality, but again, randomized control trial where staff were offered a chance to apply for work from home. Half were indeed able to work from home and half were chosen not to work from home. And so they didn't make again, any substantial changes to adapt to work from home or to train managers on managing work from home staff. Metrics for this trial, they used three metrics for productivity this time. Minutes worked per shift, calls per minute, and manager assessment of performance, also measuring retention and satisfaction. So what are the results? Over the nine months of the trial, the work from home group had a 13% performance increase, so even higher than the programmers. 9% from working more minutes per shift because they had fewer sick days and so on, fewer breaks, and 4% from more calls per minute, likely due to a quieter working environment. No manager in no difference in manager assessment of performance. So again, the second time around, managers didn't catch the improved performance of the people who were working from home most of their time, likely because they weren't able to observe this higher productivity and they weren't trained on doing so. What about other metrics? The office group attrition had 35%. The work from home group attrition had half of that attrition. So 50% better retention. So this is a huge, again, benefit to working from home that they had such reduced attrition. But promotion rate conditioned on performance decreased. 
So again, there was no manager training to assess employees working remotely, and the managers fell into the typical proximity bias, so valuing those people who are closest to them more highly. The implications of these trials. You want to try to figure out metrics to measure employees who are working hybrid that are smart, specific, measurable, actionable, relevant, and time-bound. Because otherwise, managers are unable to assess effective performance of these employees. The metrics will often not align well with manager performance evaluations because managers just can't see workers. And thus, they make a lot of mistakes when evaluating performance. Managers really need to be trained to develop and use effective metrics. If they lack training, they'll often underestimate the performance of those working remotely. Now, the methods don't tell the whole story because the studies show higher productivity for those working in remote and hybrid environments. But these are about individually oriented work metrics, so calls per minute and so on. What about collaborative work? So let's talk about a third study that looked at collaborative activities. A Harvard University working paper that looked at software engineers in a Fortune 500 firm. So they had a main campus that has two buildings several blocks apart, and they evaluated feedback given programming output and retention. So feedback given was an evaluation of collaboration, how well they collaborated with each other, especially in terms of mentoring with senior programmers giving feedback to junior programmers. Programming output is more individual performance, and of course, retention is retention. So engineers working in the same building as their teammates. So they had two buildings. Some people on the same team were in the same building. Some people on the same team were in different buildings. I don't know why. That's the way they had. So engineers working in the same building as all of their teammates received quite a bit more feedback, over a fifth more feedback, 22%, than engineers with distant teammates. And this was before COVID-19. So this was when everyone was working inside the office. After offices closed for COVID-19, this advantage narrowed to 8%. So they still received more feedback even after they initially developed their feedback approach in close proximity. Now, sitting together, however, reduces programming output by 24%, especially for senior engineers by 39%, because senior engineers are giving more feedback. And junior engineers, of course, are listening to their feedback. So in the short term, programming output decreases. So the trade-offs for proximity are more acute for women because they do more mentoring and receive more mentorship. So they give more feedback and receive more feedback. And proximity impacts career trajectories, which lowers short-run pay raises, but boosts long-run outcomes. So in the long run, you do definitely want mentoring and collaboration, but in the short run, it decreases productivity. So the implication is that individual measures of productivity are not enough. You want to measure team productivity to learn about the true impact of hybrid work to include mentoring and learning over time. So moving on to the kind of decisions and mistakes that leaders make in approaching hybrid. One of them is the status quo bias, where we have to acknowledge that our minds, how we think, evolved in the ancient savannah not in the modern world. And so any change was dangerous. It helped our survival to favor whatever the status quo is. So that's what our intuition really pushes us to do. In fact, the modern world has many more disruptions than we need to deal with, which come with major opportunities, such as the pandemic, such as hybrid work and remote work, such as the rise of smartphones, such as the rise of generative AI. And these, of course, bear challenges. So we need to understand that for leaders, it's comfortable to manage in the office, and that's what they're used to doing, especially more experienced leaders. Doing so is what feels natural and intuitive to them. So it's hard for them to adapt to the new hybrid modality. And it's also hard for employees to adapt to hybrid. They're used to their working remotely, they're used to in office. And so they really need to guidance as well as how, on how to do hybrid effectively. Let's talk about another cognitive bias called the empathy gap. We tend to underestimate the importance of other emotions and other people's decisions. For example, we've had a study from the Federal Bank of St. Louis showing that people are actually spending less time working after the pandemic, specifically highly educated men. College educated men are spending less time working after the pandemic. They are not having less workforce participation. They're participating in the workforce at the same rate, even a little bit higher, but they're spending less time actually during the week working. So they're spending less hours working. 
that means that they have a stronger preference for free time, for well-being. There's more desire for flexibility and well-being after the pandemic, and that's something that many leaders aren't appreciating. So you as benefits professionals, compensation and benefits, you really need to be thinking about that people are valuing their flexibility and well-being higher than they used to, and that le many leaders are underestimating this shift in perspective where these flexibility and well-being benefits are more valuable to people than they used to be. And finally, I want to talk about functional fixedness. Now, when people learn one way of functioning, they tend to become fixed. And that's the functional fixedness. It's kind of like the hammer nail syndrome. When you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Well, when you learn one way of functioning, like one way of leading, one way of collaborating, one way of managing people, you'll tend to become fixed in that way. So a lot of companies, even when the context is disrupted, they'll tend to function as they previously functioned, when even though old ways transform from functional to dysfunctional. So many leaders transposed office-centric methods of collaboration on remote work in March 2020, and they never stopped to change the ways that they managed people. They didn't get training on how to do so. So it's really important for them to get training, but they didn't get training on how to do so. And we need to recognize that the same applies to employees, especially those less efficient in using technical tools. They didn't get training on how to approach hybrid work and remote work. And so they still have a lot of challenges in doing so. So you need to get training and adopt best practices, which we'll talk about next. But before talking about that, I want to ask you what you think would be the most dangerous cognitive biases for the future of work in your workplace among the three we discussed. Status quo bias, empathy gap, and functional fixedness. Matt says that he never heard of someone suggested training for hybrid work. I know that I struggled with it for years and I'm just now getting comfortable. It makes a lot of sense if that's the route you're considering going. Absolutely, Matt. I mean, it just makes a lot of sense, right? And it's something that I'm glad that you're getting comfortable with it. But of course, many people are not. <laughs> many people are probably not quite as savvy as you are. And people need to get trained on how to do hybrid work, especially managers, because they need to get trained on both managing themselves and helping their employees work through in a hybrid modality effectively. Okay, I see most people participated. Let's give you five more seconds if you haven't participated yet. All right, so we see that status quo bias is by far the most powerful tendency. I definitely see this whenever I present to, comp to compensation professionals, sherm professionals, HR professionals followed by the empathy gap and functional fixedness. So good to know. So now that you know, this is something for you to take to your teams and help them make better decisions. So let's talk about best practices for competitive advantage in the future of work. Very clearly, we have a team-led model as winning out. We have the highest, when we see how you should make decisions around hybrid work modality, when to come to the office, how to approach it, it's not having individuals make the decisions just whenever they come in, whenever you want. And it's not the top leadership just making a decision for, you know, come in this Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. That's also not the best approach. The best approach is to devolve decision-making down to the rank and file team with the middle managers, lower level supervisors making the decisions for whatever works best for their teams with some coordination within broad guidelines for their department and the broader organization as a whole. And it makes sense when you think about it. Each team has different needs. So think about a team of programmers, right? They don't, they, what kind of need do they have? They, let's say they're programming on a sprint basis. So they may need to come into the office to plan their sprint and then go and program and then come back at the end of a sprint or for accountants. They might need to come in at the end of a month to close the books for a few days and then not come in during the rest of the month or come in for maybe a couple of weeks to close the books at the end of the year. For sales professionals, I tend to see them coming in more frequently where they tend to want to engage with each other and be motivated by each other when they're doing, let's say, outbound calls. So then they might wanna spend three days in the office Whereas customer service professionals, I often see them wanting to spend more time working remotely, 
because they're more working on an individual basis. So maybe when they're junior, they want to spend more time in the office. When they're more senior and well-established, they might want to spend less time in the office. So different team, and that goes to also the seniority of the team. Junior teams with more junior people benefit from spending more time in the office too, for the junior people to pick up on how to do activities, where senior people might benefit from spending less time in the office because they already know and have established relationships. So that's why you want a team-led model where the teams make the decisions for how to approach coming to the office. And you'll generally see with a team-led model, the large majority of people will have come in a hybrid modality and maybe you'll have a minority fully remote, perhaps some individual contributors like customer service professionals. So hybrid employees spend day one or two days in the office on average per week. But again, this will vary. Like I said, some accountants might spend a few days in the office at the end of a month and no days in the office, or maybe one day in the office earlier in the month. So that's going to be the majority, 70-90%. And fully remote employees, again, on a more individual contributor basis, are going to be a minority, 10 to 30%. And you want to adopt best practices in hybrid and remote work arrangements, which means providing training, as talked about and Matt noted, for effective hybrid work, what to do at home and what to focus on in the office. Now, what do you do at home and what do you focus on in the office? Well, the best things to do in the office are collaborative activities. Why come into the office to not do collaborative activities? The large majority of people prefer to do their individual work remotely. And that makes sense. When If you have a reasonable home office setup, you can be much more focused, much less distracted at home. So your focused head down work you can do at home much more effectively. You can work on your, that's kind of report writing, programming, analysis of various sorts, asynchronous communications, whether it's email or Microsoft Teams messages or Slack, you don't need to be in the office to do that. And it's kind of, you're not, there's no reason for you to be in the office for Microsoft Teams messages. And for meetings, video conference meetings, you don't need to be in the office for Zoom meetings, Microsoft Teams meetings. You're just distracting others and you're being distracted by others. What you wanna focus on in the office is collaborative activities collaborative decision-making conversations, decision conversations where leaders conveying strategy to their team members and wants to have a conversation and see how they take it. One-on-one -on -one conversations that have nuanced components, let's say performance evaluations or conflict resolution. Mentoring on the job training, especially in the earlier stages are better done in the office for most people. And socializing and team bonding are better done in the office. Now, there will be some exceptions where some people are definitely have a preference for one-on-one -on -one meetings to be done virtually, whereas I don't, but most people don't, but some people do. And there are going to be some people who prefer to work in the office on their head down work if they don't have a good home office setup or if they have trouble separating their work from their life. So that there are definitely some people. I was consulting for one company, credit union, where the CEO of the credit union actually came in to the office every day during COVID. He was the only one. He came into an office that had 30 empty seats and he was the only one just because he couldn't tolerate working from home. But that's, some people are like that and that's fine, but they're going to be the minority. And you want to train people in effective virtual communication and collaboration because the way you communicate and collaborate virtually is different than the way you communicate and collaborate in person. Now, what about performance management? So how do we manage performance? I talked earlier about how this is a huge issue, how managers can't effectively assess performance of people who are working remote. So you want to really treat people like adults and show them trust combined with appropriate accountability for both individual and collaborative tasks, including the organizational goals that the leadership identifies as necessary to accomplish. Let's talk about how you do so. So you want to transition from the once annual performance evaluations to having that, you still have that once annual performance evaluation for major performance evaluation, but you want to transition to having frequent small scale performance evaluations so that managers can actually track and see what's happening with employees who are working in a hybrid or remote modality and can coordinate with them effectively. So what you do is you have one-on-ones every week, every two weeks, every month, depending on individual employees and their seniority. The junior employees should have these more often. Once a week, senior employees should have these less frequently. So what you do is you agree on three to five goals 
for at each one-on-one. -on -one. And 24 hours before the upcoming one-on-one, -on -one, the team member sends a supervisor a report on their three to five weekly goals or bi-weekly goals or monthly goals with goal accomplishment, problem solved, self-evaluation. And so these are small scale performance evaluations, as I mentioned, weekly, monthly, or bi-monthly. Best to do in person if at all possible. So I encourage people to do these in person. And the frequency depends on what works best for different team members in the roles. So you want to discuss with each team member what fits their needs. For example, for more junior people, as I mentioned, more often works better. During the one-on-one, -on -one, what you do is the supervisor affirms or revises the performance evaluation, coaches the person on problem solving, determines any areas that might be necessary for improvement, and together you set the goals for the next one-on-one. -on -one. And the evaluation is then fed into a continuous evaluation spreadsheet, which the manager edits and the team member can always see. So the manager uses this to evaluate potential opportunities for improvement over time and promotion. Now, what are the benefits of this approach? It helps team members always know where they stand and helps them gain psychological safety about doing their activities, making mistakes if they need to, and it helps them work on areas where they can improve. That really has a major benefit for you if you're thinking about compensation and benefits uh, as a compensation and benefits professional. It helps improve their retention and helps improve their career growth because it helps build the relationship between the manager and team member, which has been strongly shown to correlate with the retention and engagement and the connection to company culture. And you want to get feedback from team members on performance management over time to review and improve the process every quarter. So that's the performance evaluation that really helps address that problem. Now, what about collaboration? So how do you address collaboration challenges? I talked about collaboration being a challenge in hybrid work. A good way to address it is virtual co-working. So what that involves is everyone on the team gets in a video conference call. So like we're on a video conference call and you turn off your microphones, your speakers are on and your video is going to be optional. And you work on your individual tasks. So you're not working on your collaborative tasks. You're not talking to others in inherently. You're staying and your goal is to work on your individual tasks. But if you have questions or you have ideas that you want to brainstorm or problem solve, you turn on your microphone and then you ask questions. And you have other people who respond to you. They turn on their microphone, they respond to you, have conversation, and then you go on to do your individual tasks. So usually what I see is that People start doing their work and they do their work for five minutes, 10 minutes, and somebody has a question. Usually it's a junior person and then they turn on their microphone and then they ask a question and then someone answers, maybe they do screen sharing and then they go on to doing their tasks. I recommend the team start with once a week for an hour and move on to once a day because it's so helpful. It's a best practice for boosting collaboration, team bonding, and company culture, and especially helpful for junior staff with on-the-job training and onboarding into company culture. Now, what about communication? So a really good practice here is the Clarity Canvas. What is that? It's a centralized hub for a team's shared documents with team goals, short, medium, and long-term goals, the roles and responsibilities of different team members, team policies, processes, instructions, and various projects and the timeline and progress on each one. Including for large projects, you should just have a separate Clarity Canvas for each project. You want to create these documents together as a team. You have all team members either in person or virtually, I recommend in person if possible. Work through each member of the team Clarity Canvas to make sure that you get on the same page and do so for each project-based Clarity Canvas as well. That will help address a lot of communication gaps and get mutual commitment and buying for the team on the way that you do your process, you do your team activities. And finally, challenges in collaboration and learning. Hybrid work, of course, we talked about is a major challenge that other peer randomized control, peer reviewed randomized control trial. You have a stronger connection to your own team, but weakening connections to other teams and to the culture as a whole. So that harms collaboration and learning, especially for junior staff. The best solution is a hybrid mentoring program. So you want two mentors as part of this program. One senior staff member, so not a supervisor from your own team. Again, this is, should be a peer-to-peer -peer relationship. So a senior staff member who is not the supervisor is providing mentoring. And then one from another part of the organization. Now, 
why do you have two people? Well, the mentor from your own team will help the junior employee with on-the-job training, quick answering of questions, and so on, for team bonding, explanation of team dynamics. And the mentor from the other part of the organization helps the junior employees with forming connections across the organization, integrating into the organizational culture, and career development for other parts of the organization. So that's what you want two people for. But what do you do during the mentoring meetings? Both mentors should meet, meet with the mentee at least once a month for 20 to 30 minutes. So it's not too much of an ask in terms of the amount of time that each mentor will spend. Ideally, you want to do it in person, especially in the beginning. Also, do a co-working session once a week. So you can mentor and mentee get in a video conference call, turn off microphones, speakers on video optional, you work on your individual tasks. If a mentee has questions, you turn on your microphone and ask for help, which is, again, very helpful for on-the-job training and onboarding into the organizational culture. Now, let me share with you the experience of someone who's gone through this approach. So this is Craig Noblock. He is the executive director of a 300 people-ish information sciences institute at the University of Southern California. And this is an organization of researchers devoted to artificial intelligence, cybersecurity, and other information technology topics. So as you can imagine, a very hot field. And he will share about his experience adopting this approach. So let's see what Craig has to say. Uh, Gleb Zabersky came came to my attention sometime back during the pandemic when uh, I was planning to have our research institute uh, follow the standard path that all the big corporations are following. So Apple and Google were announcing plans to have people come back three days a week. So I thought that seems like a good plan. So we actually sent out a message said, okay, starting this date, everyone's coming back three days a week, uh, and then, you know, can work from home two days a week. Uh, and and then I saw a video that Gleb actually, a uh, video talk that Gleb actually gave for IEEE uh, that really actually changed my mind about this. And it was a video about hybrid work and how important it was to actually embrace it. And, uh, uh, and one of the things I was impressed in the video is that all these interesting ideas about how to make hybrid work more effective and stuff. So I signed up for a meeting with Gleb and uh, uh, learned quite a bit more about you know, how to do hybrid work well. And so Gleb has come on as a consultant for the Information Science Institute and has been really helpful in terms of putting us much more in a leadership position in terms of figuring out how to do hybrid work. So we changed our policies. We are much more flexible about who can work at home and, and allowing people to work from home, you know, whatever makes sense with respect to their supervisor, uh, creating spaces in people's home offices, uh, figuring out how to onboard people in a way that, you know, when people haven't met in person, that is more effective. Uh, so I think he's been incredibly helpful in terms of really transitioning us to be a, sort of a lead in, in how we manage hybrid work at the, at the Institute. So it's been incredibly useful with all of Club's advice, and I appreciate all the help he's given us with respect to moving forward with this, our hybrid work plans. Okay, and I saw that Adam asked the question on part of day in the office situations. Yeah, absolutely. So what we did with Craig uh, and, the exec and the Information Science Institute is we created a natural way of doing so by having cookie and coffee hours at two o'clock each day, and then for Monday, Wednesday, for Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, and then on Thursday, we have lunch at 12 o'clock. And so those serve as natural social destinations. So some people come in early in the morning and they stay through lunch or cookie hour, you know, and then they leave. Or some people come in late in the day and then they, or come in later just for the cookie hour and then, or for lunch, and then they stay through the evening. So the goal is to, this is, again, this is Los Angeles, so you definitely want to beat the commute. And so people beat the, either the morning commute or the evening commute. And coffee badging 
is just the term for coming in and having some coffee and leaving. So you can also do that. You can, for another organization that I'm working with, we set up core hours of 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. and focus hours of 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. and 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. So the organization is structured so that there is no, there are no meetings, internal meetings at least, from 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. and 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. There are only internal meetings from 10 to 3. And people are welcome to come in for the period, for this common hours, core hours, from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. And then they're not expected to be there from 8 a.m. I mean, they don't come in every day, but they come in once, twice, maybe three times a week, depending on the person and their schedule. But the key is that you don't have internal meetings at 9 a.m. so that people have to be in rush hour or at 5 p.m. so they have to be in rush hour going home. They have internal meetings from 10 to 3. So you don't have to, so you can come in at a time when you beat the rush hour and you can go home after a meeting. But usually people will stay from 10 to 3 p.m. because there's more of an expectation that, hey, you'll be spending, if you come to the office, you'll be spending the rest of the time in the office and socializing, collaborating with people, meeting with them and so on. Dr. Gleb, I have a question. Um, how do you recommend to companies that that have dispersed employee populations? How do you, how do remote people that um, you know can never come into the office, right? Have the coffee mm -hmm. badging and the um, the right. schmoozing, if you will. Sure. So what we do in those situations, what my consulting company does is we set up virtual coffee hours. So virtual coffee hours include matching people to have virtual coffee with each other once a week. So people opt in, both people who are fully remote and people who are in the office to randomly be matched with people across the organization who also opted in to this virtual coffee activity. And the company provides people with $5 per virtual coffee to get coffee and then just chat with each other for half an hour. And that provides the connection for people who are spending time virtually, who are fully remote or distributed. That's one way. Another thing that we do is we set up events. So events that people can do that are social activities. And that can involve, that has involved things like playing video games together with a Discord channel. Some people, especially younger people, appreciate that. Then movie watching together. That's another activity. Then virtual training sessions together. So again, an educational activity. Virtual escape rooms and other sorts of a little bit out of the box activities. Those activities are quite helpful for building bonds as well. And those are for more group activities. But for one-on-one, -on -one, the virtual coffees has been quite helpful. So it's always one-on-one? -on -one? No. So the virtual coffee is one on one, the right. ga the video games, the escape rooms, the movie watching and the educational activities are group activities, team activities. So So one more question, sorry. So for the sure. the coffee one on ones, do do you provide like icebreaker questions uh to help people because that can be awkward for some people to to go into a a Zoom or whatever platform you're using to, um, you know, sit in front of somebody you don't know. Absolutely. Yeah. We provide clear icebreaker questions for people mm -hmm. to have the conversation with each other. Yes. And we cool. also, what we do, what I do with each, what we do with each company we consult with is we have each team member create a personal user manual, which is a way for them to describe themselves, their communication preferences, their likes and dislikes, a little bit about their personal life. So they exchange those before they have that coffee chat, virtual coffee chat. So there's already a topic for conversation. But yes, there's also a template, just like there is a template. So we have a template for mentoring meetings. What do you do in mentoring meetings? And Because for some people, that's going to be awkward if they're not natural mentors. So that's going to be helpful as well. For Very cool. Thank you. Here, I'm going to put uh, in the chat a set of apps that we use to randomly oh. match people. So that's kind of a, I don't, I'm not financially associated with any app, 
Uh, and the, you'll see that there are a number of apps that you can choose, that you can go from. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Michelle uh, talks about uh, lunch for employees. Yeah, we have. I've done that. Uh, we've done that for companies that had distributed teams. So having someone organizing lunch, also having people matched for lunch in the headquarters. So again, opting in for lunch matching. That's also a useful idea. Other people, other questions. I know we have a couple of minutes more for questions. So please go ahead. Any other remaining questions? Dr. Gleb, um, hi, Peter Lepore is here. Hi, um, Peter. You mentioned the importance of trust, management trust mm -hmm. on one of your yes. previous slides. To me, it seems like one of the keys to, to allowing and, and continuing a successful hybrid arrangement because mm -hmm. You know, one or two bad apples who game the system or take advantage mm -hmm. of it, and that makes its way up to some senior management. There can yeah. easily be a a reaction where they shut the whole thing down or sure. or put in rules to 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 curtail it. Have have you seen this? And and what are organizations doing to kind of avoid that knee jerk reaction and and um kind of keep 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 the one or two bad apples from souring the the experience for everybody else who is having a a, a really positive uh experience out of it yeah that's very important thank you for asking that peter the first thing to the first thing to recognize is that you'll have bad apples in the office as well as working remotely and so management needs to learn and accept that that you'll have some bad apples and that that will be inevitable, that it's just going to be the case that there will be some people who will take advantage of the situation. So that's going to be the first step. So there are just going to be some people who do that. The second is to in is to have that small scale frequent performance evaluation to minimize that possibility. If you have small scale frequent performance evaluations every week, every two weeks, every month, then you'll be able to catch that much more quickly because you're actually seeing people's performance every week, two weeks, a month, and you'll be able to see, okay, if somebody is underperforming, then you are able to catch that and have a performance plan in place to address their underperformance. And if you need to, if they don't perform under the performance plan, then, then they should go. As opposed to the typical case when you wait until the annual performance evaluation. So when the management gets really pissed is when somebody has been underperforming for a year <laughs> and they don't catch that in a timely manner, right? And that's understandable. So in order to address that, you need to first realize that some people underperform. And the second thing you need to realize is that you need to have those frequent small-scale performance evaluations because otherwise you will be have people who will just take advantage. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate You're it. welcome, Peter. You're welcome. Other folks? So we have one more time for one more question. I know we're at 10 a.m., so people have to drop off. I'll take one more question, or we can finish up. So if anyone has any one last question, I'll answer it. All right, I don't see any questions. Do you want to finish us out? Absolutely. Um, well, on behalf of our, our membership, our guests and the Watcher Board, uh, Dr. Gleb, I want to express our sincere gratitude for sharing your valuable insights and expertise in this area. Uh, I feel like armed with these powerful best practices, we'll not only be able to navigate, but lead the rapid evolution of engagement. Um, I think it's fair to say that it's time to redefine our possibilities for our teams, the profession, and the future of work itself. Um, for Thank those uh, needing uh, CEUs for recertification, um, Annette, can we uh, share that slide? Or Anne? Do you not see it? No. Okay, let me, sorry. Do you see it now? We do. Sorry. Thank you so Great. much. 
Um, okay. Um, thank you. Thank you, Annette. Uh, again, thank you all for joining us. We know your time is valuable. We appreciate you uh, providing some great questions and comments for our webinar. Um, we hope to see you March 20th for our next in-person program, Financial Wellness Strategies, Nurturing Prosperity and Wellbeing in the Workplace. It will be held at Hub International and Tyson's. We'll be starting with a continental breakfast at 8.30 with networking. And then one more reminder to check out our website, watradc.org for other upcoming events and membership and sponsorship information. Thank you all so much. And we hope you have a great rest of your day.